and welcome to another Cliff List webinar. And today I'm very pleased to have uh, Frank Kermit as my special guest. Frank has had a long and arduous and interesting journey to where he is today. And uh, I guess we've known each other for forever since uh, the beginning of the community, basically. And yeah. uh, I want uh, to give you an opportunity here to tell us a little bit about that past history, about your journey, about uh, you know pr how you got from where you were to where you are today. And uh, let's uh, take it from there. And hopefully the guys will pick up some very good uh, uh, tips and information on how to become more successful with women from you today. Okay. Let me start off uh, where um, with my background. Some things that I share when I do one-on-one -on -one coaching that I haven't really shared in the media uh, are specific elements of my background that uh, when I do share them in coaching with clients, uh, really allow the clients to understand that I get where they're coming from. I grew up in an environment where sex was seen as something evil and bad and only necessary if you plan to have children. So anything that leads to uh, possible interactions between men and women it would be discouraged strongly. Uh, when I was eight years old, I had an older cousin who told me that unless I was really strong and really good looking and uh, I would never get a girlfriend and never get married. And the reason that, that memory has surfaced for me is because as a father now of a little boy, I, I can't imagine what the hell he was thinking when he was bombarding me with those type of beliefs. I wasn't even that heavy as a kid, but when you're constantly told that, oh, you have a little bit of baby fat, and you better take care of that because then no one's going to love you. And you grow up with that, and then you add on the shame and guilt associated with just even admitting you like a girl. That will screw a person up. So that's the type of environment I grew up in. Leading on to going to the high school senior prom, um, all I really wanted was to be able to take a date to the prom. And there's a girl that I have been friends with. She did not go to my school, but obviously I had a crush on her and I was the guy she called at three o'clock in the morning when she wanted to complain about the jerks that she was dating. And uh, I finally got the courage to ask her to the prom. Um, she stood me up and that's what I detail as one of the first major strikes in my life uh, that led me to seeking out our little underground community. The second major strike at this point, I was in university. I'd had a few girlfriends in college because despite whatever I was told, I just said no. I, I knew that there was something other than everything that I was being told. I watched a lot of television and television for all of the damage it may have done me and, and my peers did at least present me with an example of the fact that, well, there's a world out there that's actually okay for boys and girls to date and get together and find love and that sex wasn't this horrible, evil thing, you know, that people only do when they want to have kids. Sex could actually be something enjoyable and something that people do because they want to be together. And so by the time I got into university, I'd gone to college, I had lost my virginity, had some girlfriends along the way. Uh, met a girl, got very, very serious with her, and I put it in my head that, yeah, that's the girl I'm going to marry. Uh, you know, I, I refer to her in my autobiography from loser to seducer as my fiance. And in the end, uh, we had an on-again, off-again relationship, a lot of problems between us. And, and just, just for the record, she's not a bad person. You know, I'm still friends with her today. Uh, after a long absence apart, she's not a bad person, but we just were not compatible. And she ended up leaving me for my then best friend. And that is what I call my strike two, because it shattered every concept I had about what a relationship was supposed to be and how when you really love somebody, that should be enough and it's going to work and it doesn't. 
moving forward, still completely shattered from the heartbreaks and so on, met a, another girl and I hung out with her for about two years. So when I say hung out, I mean, we talked on the phone, we went out places together, which I paid for. Uh, and she made it clear that her and I, very sorry about that. Just give me a second. Uh, while we were together, she made it very clear that her and I could not be together, uh, because we were of a different race, religion, and culture. And then one day she surprises me by saying, Frank, I want to take you out to dinner. And I thought, oh, well, this is a change. So she took me out to dinner. She gave me gifts and I was thinking, this is really nice. And I'm driving her home and she says, Frank, there's something I have to tell you. I said, okay, well, what is it? She says, you know, I want to be really honest with you. Now, the first thing that's coming to my mind is she's going to tell me that she's changed her mind. She's willing to give me a chance. We could be boyfriend and girlfriend. We could be together now. And she says, I have a boyfriend. Okay. Not what I was hoping to hear. And don't get me wrong. I mean, I wasn't thrilled about it, but she had always said that the reason she could not be with me was because we were of a different race, religion, and culture. And I found it refreshing that at least I met one woman who says something and then sticks to it. So I could be respectful of that. And as she told me more about this boyfriend, it turns out that he was of a different race, religion, and culture. And I, and I just, uh, I just freaked out. I said, what are you talking about? I said, you said we couldn't date because of that. So what did this guy have that I didn't have? And her response was, I didn't plan for it to happen. It just happened. He seduced me. Basically, whereas I respected the boundary, the other guy really per pursued her. And um, driving home that night after I dropped her off uh, was really unpleasant. Uh, my hands were shaking so bad from sheer frustration, I had to get off the road at one point. Um, when I finally was able to calm down enough and go home, that was the night I said, that's it, Like I, I can't go on like this. The degrees, the awards that I'd won in my profession, None of it mattered to me anymore because I had nobody to share it with. And that's all I really wanted. It wasn't like I wanted, you know, uh, a couple of hundred notches on my belt. I wanted a girlfriend. I wanted a wife. And um, that was the night I said, I'm either going to fix this part of my life or I'm going to kill myself. It was my never again moment. Never again am I going to go through this. Never again am I going to subject myself to this. The other thing that came through my mind that night was, okay, that girl with the prom, yeah, I could say that she was a bad person and I just got screwed over. My ex fiance leaves me for my best friend. Okay, I, I just got really unlucky, right? I just, I, I just ended up with the wrong person because obviously, you know, it wasn't my fault. But when the third time happened, that's when I had to start taking accountability for my life. That's when I had to start, I started taking responsibility because the common element in all three major strikes against me, the common element was me. And I said, if this keeps happening to me, it's gotta be because of me. There's something I'm doing wrong. Whether there's a behavior that I'm doing something that's attracting these kind of people to me, whether it's my thought process as to why I'm choosing to try and make relationships work with these individuals, something's going on because if it happens once to you, then you can say, look, you just got unlucky. But when it happens consistently to you, you got to take responsibility. You are the common element in every problem you have. And that was the night I decided I got to fix this and I got to make this work or it's just not worth going on. And that's where I began my journey. And I grabbed every book I could find on the topics of dating and relationships and seduction, uh, every audio program I could find, every VHS videotape, I'm dating myself here, every audio cassette, you name it. I, I just, I devoured it trying to find some kind of an answer. That led to the study of material from some mutual friends of ours and 
uh, later I learned that it wasn't just me going through this. There was a cultural phenomena happening that materialized into what is now known as the subduction community. And it was shortly after that process that you and I met. And you met me after I had had that you know moment of rebirth. Because that night is when I said, this can never happen to me again. That was the night that my new identity was born. Didn't have a name for it. Didn't know what was going to come of it. But because I said, never again, a new identity had to be born that night. And you had met me, I think, I would say probably about 12 months into this new journey where uh, obviously, uh, I wasn't seeing anybody at the time. I was in a miserable, miserable state. My health was absolutely terrible. Wasn't taking care of myself at all. And um, when we met and then we, uh, we did some uh, organizing of other men in this uh, same situation and put together their little support group, that was the beginning of uh, my journey. And in that journey, I studied a lot of different people's material. I tried a lot of things. I embarrassed myself sometimes going out and making a fool of myself all in the name of experimentation. And sometimes things worked out a little bit. And it took three years, three years of constant trial and error just to get to having my first lover in five years. So there was a two-year dry spell uh that incident happened i you know it took me three more years to get to that first lover again and with everything that i'd learned i documented my journey i wrote everything down so that way you know if something worked for me i'd be able to go back to my journal and say okay that worked for me this happened and it was everything from okay first i would just struggle to get a girl to meet me on a date then it was about okay i got my first date but i wasn't getting any second dates Okay, now I'm getting my second and my third dates, but it's not leading up to sex. What am I doing wrong? And again, it was trial and error, trial and error, trial and error, documenting everything that worked for me and everything that did not. And once I got that first lover in five years, and I said, okay, this is what works for me. These are the behavior patterns. These are the conversation topics. These are the things I'm staying away from in my communication, but these are the things I'm doing uh, proactively on purpose. Okay, let me apply this again. And within the span of six months, I went from having one regular lover to ethically dating five women at the same time that all knew about each other. They may not have liked the fact that I was dating other people, but I was honest about it from the get-go because that was one of the things that I wanted to practice in my life. And that is uh, ethically dating more than one person at the same time, just so I could have that experience. Again, it wasn't trying to get a bunch of notches on my belt. I wasn't interested in one-night stands. What I wanted was the same girl coming back on a regular basis. And so just practicing the same repeating beha behavior patterns, finding what works, I went from the one lover to the five lovers at the same time over the course of six months. And that first, uh, for lack of a better term, that first harem, that first circle of lovers uh, lasted about, I would, I think it was about three months and those, it was in those three months I realized, wow, I'm, I'm finally doing it. I, I, I achieved my goal. And it was a day when I was walking home from work and I was thinking, okay, I saw girl number two yesterday. Girl number three is sending me emails. I got to answer them tonight. Girl number four is possibly coming over tonight. I got girl number one possibly coming over on the weekend and that's when I realized and I said, wow, other than my full-time job, my time is really, really completely bamboozled by dating these five women all at the same time. And that's when I realized, okay, I made the change. That continued on for uh, a period of time. About a year or so later, I rekindled with my ex fiance and the total timeline is from the time that she left me for my best friend to the time that I got her back for about two or three months uh, was seven years. 
there was a seven year absence and I got her back and I figured, okay, now I've learned everything I'm supposed to learn. I've been able to make it work with a bunch of other women. I've had such amazing experiences. I know what I'm doing now. And we got together. And at the beginning when we got together, it was magical. It was wonderful. It was like, I was able to forgive myself for the mistakes I made in the past because I could trust myself not to make the same mistakes again. That's what I call redemption when I'm helping guys in coaching and we want to reach that point of redemption. It's reaching that point where you can trust yourself not to make the same mistakes in the past that you made in the past. That's when you can really self forgive. And despite all of that, it still didn't work with me and my ex. Not because I was a bad person and not good enough, or she was a bad person, not good enough. But even when you have love and you have attraction, to make a long-term relationship work, you also need some, some kind of compatible value, some kind of compatible basis. So that ended, but when it ended there, I got closure on it. I had a number of relationships after that with each one just being a little bit better than the last, each one getting a little bit closer to where I was, uh, where I wanted to be, I should say, and further away from what I was. And... You have to understand, I had a career path already. I already had something else I wanted to do. Becoming a coach in this business was the furthest thing from my mind. I, I didn't want to get involved, okay? It was, I just didn't want to have to deal with, with that aspect of it. I didn't want to get into the business side of it. What started happening is that as people saw that I was doing well, and it's usually my friends and a, a number of friends that, that you know, a number of our mutual friends, they started to come to me for advice. So I would just meet up, we meet up with them in cafes and uh, I would just impart the knowledge the same way that our mentors had spoken to us and helped us. And this just started happening more and more. At one point, I remember going to a cafe and there was like 10 guys sitting around the table all taking notes on everything I said. Uh, I was getting tired of it because I was spending so much time doing that when, okay, I got into this so that I could, I could date women and have good relationships. But if I'm helping a bunch of guys, I'm not spending time with women, right? So the next thing I knew, um, I was thinking, okay, I'm just going to sit down and I'm going to write a book and I'll release the book with everything I knew about it, everything I learned about it, and then these people will leave me alone. Uh, around the same time, somebody had come over, was a friend of a friend who had come over just asking for help. Helped him out one night, gave him a good place to, gave him a good understanding of, of what his situation needed. And he hands me some money and he says, here, thanks a lot. And I said, look, dude, I'm, I'm not doing this for the money. He's like, no, 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 you, you've earned it. Thank you. I appreciate it. And he left. And I sat there holding the money and I said, damn, uh, maybe, maybe I could make a living doing this. Still wasn't convinced. I was still thinking, let me write the book, release it, and then people will leave me alone. So I wrote the book. My first book was From Loser to Seducer. It was my autobiography. I wanted people to know my story. There's a lot of more in that book that, that I'm obviously not going to get into now in this interview. I then wrote the book Everything Out of Her Mouth is a Test, which is my belief systems on the emotional needs of women and what helped me to go from having nothing and having my heart broken so many times to having five lovers at the same time. Because one of the things about having those five lovers at the same time was it was an incredible time of experimentation for me. I was thinking, okay, what if I try to communicate this to a particular girl? You know, for example, I have an incredible fear of divorce. I want to see what happens when I communicate my fear of divorce to each girl as a means to explain why I want to make sure that when I finally do end up with one person to marry, it's going to last forever and not to be something that lasts a couple of years. And I would tell one girl the same thing, and then I would tell the second one, and then I would tell the third one, and I would document all of their reactions. And if somebody in the group really reacted bad, I would use that as feedback and say, okay, this is a communication. Somebody's reacting bad to what I said, so let me modify it slightly before I tell the next girl. And again, it just continued that process. So when I wrote everything out of her mouth as a test, I thought, okay, my autobiography is out there so people know my story. They know I'm not just somebody with, uh, who likes to write and who writes generic stuff. I wanted them to know, no, this is real. This is real situations that happen to me. Uh, 
and instead of people leaving me alone, they read the books and they started coming to me more and they wanted to ask me more questions and even more people wanted to hang out with me. And that's when I decided, okay, let me see if I could make a living doing this as a coach uh, because I had already become disenchanted with the career that I was already in for, for a lot of other reasons. And one of which is, and this is for all the guys here who are getting into this now, when you change yourself as a person to make relationships and dating work for you, you may change so much that the careers and other life decisions you made prior to this that worked for you then aren't going to work for you anymore because you're becoming a different person. You'll still have some of your same basic values, but the more you learn about how to make relationships work, the higher your expectations go about the way you need to be treated. And that carries over into your work life. And you might find that the careers that suited you before may not suit you anymore. So that's how I got into the business side of this. Um, today, I'm working full time as a coach. I've now written over 20 books. And I don't use any ghost writers. I, it's coming from me. So when you see my name as the author, I'm the writer. Um, I've appeared in media, newspapers as a columnist, uh, television appearances, uh, regular radio appearances, podcasts, and, and other mediums like this one. Uh, over 75 hours of audio lecture that I sell on my website doing coaching programs. I've been called upon to coach people in the matchmaking industry. I've even coached other coaches at this point who, you know, because everybody needs somebody to offer them a little bit of clarity. And at this point, I've got coaches coming to me as well. Um, and I'm married and I'm also a father. And I got a little boy to brings me a joy I, I never thought I could have. So getting back to being that eight-year-old chunky kid who was told he would never be good-looking enough or good enough to ever find a girlfriend to getting and, and having a family. Um, at this point, I'm happy with a lot of what's going on now, but I had to work hard for it. And that's, that's where I'm at now. Well, that was quite a journey. Yeah, um, you know, uh, I uh, I guess one of the things that uh, struck me throughout some of your comments is that um, you know you've you've obviously learned from you know as you mentioned trial and error and some mistakes you made in the past. Maybe you could go over a couple of the solutions that you maybe you've come to from from those experiences. Sure. Um... One of the solutions, number one, and this is my uh, major theory with the emotional needs of women, it's a very stern belief system. She's either your mother or she's your lover. She cannot be both. If you're doing something that is triggering her mothering instincts, even if she's happy to do it, even if she is you know, more than happy to be mothering to you in that moment, it's turning her off. She may not even realize that it's turning her off. You may not even realize that it's turning her off. But if you've ever had the experience of a woman saying to you, I don't know, I mean, I, I liked you a lot before, but now I just, I'm just not feeling it. You know, it's not you, it's me. I'm just, I don't know what I'm feeling or I'm feeling confused. I mean, this is a girl who, you know, a month or so ago would have been happy to get naked with you, and now she's not sure what she's feeling. Chances are you've triggered that mothering instinct a bit too much. Now, here's the definition, okay? Here's a concrete definition. If she's doing something for you that you should be doing for yourself, she's being your mother. One of the things that I learned just not to do is when girls would come over to my place, if the girl decided, oh, you know what, I want to participate, I want to help out, here, let me do your dishes, I would say, no, I don't want you to do my dishes. You're not here for that. Now, go into the living room. I got a liquor cabinet in there. Pour yourself a drink, or I got some fruit drinks if you don't want alcohol, and the mini fridge is there. Go light some candles, and I'll join you in a moment. I wouldn't dare let her do something where 
I could do it myself. I can do my own dishes. I can load them up into a dishwasher. She doesn't have to stand there to do F all. She's not my mother. I remember one morning I woke up and the girl that I was involved with at the time, she had gotten up uh, a little bit earlier than me. And when I walked into the kitchen, she was sweeping the floor. I said, what are you doing sweeping the floor? This is not your house. And she says, well, I just thought I would sweep the floor and do something nice. I said, no, no, no. There's other nice things you can do for me. Sweeping the floor is not one of them. Now, I took a very, very hard stance on that. But that's because one of the things I learned is that when I used to let women do stuff of that, like that for me, it was killing the attraction because she started acting mothering towards me. Even though it wasn't me asking them to do stuff, they were volunteering. One girl tried to do my laundry, you know? I was like, no, I don't want you dusting my laundry. It's my laundry. I can do it. I would rather hire a maid to come in and do my housework than to allow the girls that I was seeing to do that. So, no, you're not doing something for me that I could do myself. When trying to uh, make plans for the evening, Sure, I could say to the girl, look, whatever you want to do is fine with me. You can plan the evening and I'll go along. As a nice guy, nice guys want to make women happy. They don't want to hurt women. They don't want to be insulting. They don't want to be overbearing. A nice guy says, well, if she's happy going to restaurant A and then event B and, and whatnot, I'm good with that. Here's the problem. When you give her that much work to do, she doesn't appreciate it. She's not thinking, wow, he's really open-minded and great. She's thinking, I'm starting to feel like his mother because he's not doing these things that he could do for himself. That's what I'm talking about by mothering. If she starts doing things that essentially you could be doing yourself, she's now acting like a mother figure in your life. And the minute a woman starts acting mothering to you, that's what kills the attraction. In the position I'm in now, I have actually coached couples that have been together for many, many years, they're on the verge of a divorce. And I got to somehow bring them back to a time when they did have that love and that interest and that motivation. I'm not saying that, oh, it just rekindles because love is different as it evolves over time in the course of a relationship. But one of the things that I make the guys in those dynamics realize is she's now doing things for you that because she's mothering you and you may have kids together and so on, she's not feeling that sense of being a lover she can't mother you and be your lover that's why uh i tell a lot listen focus on yourself and relieving her the responsibility of money so anything that the guy does for himself that relieves her of that burden of being a mother figure that's what allows her to start feeling attraction again it's an interesting uh, theory. I think it, it. I think it's probably a more helpful theory for guys than uh, probably the alternative, which you hear about. I think a little bit more frequently, which is, you know, trying to get women to invest. And I think that that's a almost a conflicting theory. Although probably in certain certain instances that could be a complementary. Okay, I can I can address this actually. Yes, you want a girl to invest herself into you, all right? But the reward has to be the lifestyle and the way you make her feel. If she's not going to feel anything for investing in you, then there's no motivation for her to invest. If you get her to invest in you, and that's the only reason that she's sticking around, you're going to constantly have make her invest in you and make her invest in you and that becomes a power game between the two in the short term will it work yeah in the long term will it work no because after a while you can't continue to use up your own energy constantly making someone invest so it's a, it's the same uh, dynamic as the difference between being a pickup artist and being what i would call a seducer as a pickup artist you're in the moment and you're not thinking really long term. You're looking to get what you want to get right now. I'm not judging it. I'm just calling it for what it is. As a seducer, you're looking to get something going here that's going to come back and give you more. I, that's why I was never really interested in one night stands. The same work I got to do to get a one night stand is the same work I would do to get a girl to have sex with me on the first date and have her come back. But each time she comes back, it's because of the way I made her feel.
It's because of the lifestyle that I can supply her. And by the way, my lifestyle isn't about spending money on her. You know me personally. You know I don't have money to spend on other people. I barely got money to spend on myself. It's the way I made them feel. I decorated my uh, apartment in such a way that when people came over, they knew that they were free to be sexual beings. In complete contrast to the way I was brought up, and I don't know if, uh, Cliff, you've been to my my old bachelor apartment. Uh, do you remember any of it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, every, every part of it had a story. Exactly. The walls were painted Viking blue with white clouds painted on the ceiling. The bedroom had, was painted moonless night with glow-in-the-dark stars. And everywhere you worked, there was tasteful sexual artwork even in the fish aquarium there were um there there were statues that the fish were swimming around of people uh, of, of nudes involving themselves in some type of, of sexual uh, position it was wall to wall you're free to be who you want to be here and I remember there were some women who came in and at first they were shocked, like, oh my goodness, I can't believe you have this art and that art and that. But they loved coming back multiple times because it was the one place where whether they wanted to show a little bit or whether they wanted to show a lot, they could be themselves and not feel judged. That's how you get somebody to invest in you. Not by making demands on them, but by making them feel something that they crave to feel. And that's what brings them back. You may have to make demands on a person at the very beginning of an interaction just to let them know you won't tolerate bad behavior. One of the challenges of when you make somebody invest and you make them jump through hoops and you make them jump through hoops, you're not necessarily getting a quality person who's already a giving person. You're getting somebody who's just going to jump through hoops for as long as you stay overly dominant. And that's not really the type of person you can trust with your bank account down the road. It's not the type of person that you can trust to call 911 if you're in a particular emergency. Um, you know, one thing that I would like to delve into a little bit, because I think a lot of your journey probably resonates with a lot of the guys that are reading uh, Cliff's List these days, and that is you came from a place of, of being sort of... Um, you, you you didn't have the, the social skills that, no. you know, some guys are, are fortunate to have maybe a very alpha father and uh, or some experience in their life, which, you know, right from the start, they were they were killing it. Yeah. Um, what what could you say to a guy today that, uh, you know, he's he's what, you know, like I, I think a lot of guys write me and they tell me how they they read these these stories and they read the uh, and they watch these videos and they listen to these interviews and they just you know they just they're in awe of of these guys who are able to you know basically have physical relationships with women whereas to them it's like this this mountain that they can't they cannot this overwhelming this, this overwhelming obstacle yes okay an entire branch of my practice right now is working with adult male virgins and that's because of how many of them I found were coming to me for help. Uh, you know, as a guy comes up, he's like, okay, you'll tell me a bit about your story. And so many of them turned out to be adult male virgins who are suffering in the way that you're describing. They're, they're missing just basic social skills. My advice to them, and if this is you, dude, I was there, okay? Read my autobiography. Uh, yeah, I got myself some girlfriends along the way when I finally got to college but I had to deal with a lot of personal demons even when I was with those girls. Uh, imagine finally having sex and dealing with pains and pains of guilt for having sex and <gasps> touching a girl and letting a girl touch me. I mean, it was, it was not a pleasant time. There, the things I would want to say to you is that, look, you can make this change. But you have to understand that you can't do the same things you've always been doing. You're going to have to make some very strict changes in your behavior. You may have to give up some hobbies you really like. And not because there's anything wrong with your hobbies per se, but it's just you're going to need the time to sit down and reevaluate 
what it is you want to do. If you want to just learn how to have conversations with people, you may have to step away from the gaming console and actually practice having conversations with people to get good for with it. Nothing wrong with gaming. Nothing wrong with reading books. Nothing wrong with being an introvert. I'm, I'm, listen, there's a lot of value to those things. That's why you do them, because they make you happy. They make you feel good. But when you're trying to make a change in your life, you need the time to practice. So you may have to give up those things that really make you feel good, your escapism. Um, one of the things that I had to give up during that period of time is that I gave up reading newspapers. I gave up reading comic books. I gave up, uh, I used to collect bottle caps as a kid. I mean, I collected that thing for, I think, from the age of nine till 29. Uh, and I got into, I got into this in my late twenties. So, I mean, after 20 years of collecting bottle caps, I gave that up too. Nothing wrong with bottle cap collecting or reading comic books or reading the newspaper or that sort of thing. Nothing wrong with watching the same sitcoms over and over and over. I mean, you know, you're, you're not going out and killing anybody, so you're doing pretty good. But you have to understand that it's a question of the amount of time that you have. And you're going to need to dedicate a significant amount of time to make this switch over. It's not just enough to learn about the 10 emotional needs of women. You actually have to take the time to practice memorizing that list of 10 emotional needs and some of the behaviors that you're going to have to start enacting. For example, when you're out in a social environment, no sexual jokes, no jokes at anybody's expense, whether or not you know them personally. That one thing automatically puts you further ahead in the world of charisma. And yes, I know we've all know that one jerk who seems to get girls because he puts people down. He's not getting the girls because he puts people down. He's getting the girls despite putting people down because these particular girls are looking for a jerk. You have to be mindful of the fact that when you start insulting people and putting people down, that turns off the women who might be willing to give you a chance, but they realize... This guy wouldn't protect my reputation if I dated him and maybe things were a bit rocky at first. And I know that right now, this is a major one. I get it that right now you might see yourself as the good guy. You see yourself as the hero of your own story. You don't see that you've done anything wrong. Well, that's one of the bubbles I'm going to have to burst for you. Remember my story? I got stood up at the prom, lost my ex-fiance to my best friend, hung out with a girl for two years that ended up marrying somebody else despite the fact that I was respectful to her and I was there for her. In all three things, I was always thinking, I'm the good guy in this. In these three situations, that's not fair. I'm going to burst your bubble here, okay? I wasn't the hero in these three situations. I wasn't the victim in these three situations. I behaved in ways that brought about those results. The girl who stood me up for my prom, did I go rent a limo? Did I, uh, did I go make it a point to, to go pick her up? No. I suggest that everybody was going to meet at my place because, oh, man, I don't want to put it on my credit card. I don't want to get a limo. I had relatives who offered, hey, man, I'll drive you around on the night of your prom. And I just didn't want help from the family to do this. Okay, just that alone might have made a difference. But no, I triggered her mothering instincts. You want to get really tough with myself here? Why the hell would I choose a girl to take to prom with me that there were red flags leading up to that? And I didn't spot them. I didn't realize that, oh, well, we had had arguments and fights about these other things. Hello? What the hell was I doing making that choice? Same thing with my ex fiance we had an on again off again relationship what was i thinking that said well on again off again relationship yeah that's somebody i should marry uh, i'm responsible there i wasn't the good guy i wasn't the hero there i was a participant in a bad repeating behavior pattern and i have to own that and that's probably the biggest bubble burster there is the fact is is that if you're not getting the results you want it's on you and you might not be the hero you think you are. And until you change that little element, 
you're always going to find ways to justify how what you're doing is right and everybody else is wrong. Well, if what you're doing is right and you're not getting the results, then what you're doing is not right. Well, I think that that's uh, going to apply to a number of guys, but I think there's a, another subset of guys who are perhaps a little more meek and shy and uh, just don't see themselves as being attractive enough to, uh, to or attractive or skilled socially enough to uh, engage a woman in, in uh, enough of a discussion, conversation, leading into any kind of uh, actual physical relationship. Ah, okay. So we're dealing with the super shy guys. For super shy guys, okay, let me first of all talk about how you may not feel if you're attractive or not. I'm ugly. Okay, I've got a bit of a nice face. I've got some pretty eyes, but I've been told flat out by people I'm ugly. I've been told by professionals in the entertainment industry. Uh, I, even if I get onto TV once in a while, I'll never get a regular gig on TV because I'm too ugly. Uh, no woman has ever looked at my body and said, ooh, Frank, I want to fuck that. You know, most women look at my body and say, Frank, fuck that. I don't get women on my looks. I've gone up and down in my weight. There are going to be people who are going to reject you for the way you look. My own personal philosophy is 25% of the people out there are going to hate you no matter what you do. You could be the best at what you do, really great looking, et cetera, et cetera. 25% of the people are just going to hate you anyway. 25% of the people are going to love you. They're going to love you no matter what you do. You could be the biggest screw up. You can commit horrible acts of, of, of violence, and they're still going to love you because they're part of that 25% subset. 50% of the people out there, they'll look to you to dictate how they should receive you. If you like yourself enough, if you love yourself enough, they'll think, oh, well, I should be open to liking this person too. If you don't think that you're good enough, they'll say, well, if he doesn't think he's good enough, then I shouldn't think he's good enough. So that's, that's for you people out there who feel you're just not good enough, good looking enough, okay? And I guarantee you that no matter how unattractive you feel you are, there's probably a lot of people out there who would want to be with you. They may not necessarily be the ones that you're looking at. They may not necessarily be the ones that you would give a chance to, but there's people out there who are going to want you. Even at my ugliest, I was still able to bring a girl to my bed, not because of the way I looked, but despite it, because of the way I made them feel. And if you're really, really shy, then you have to use that as your advantage. You're shy. You're maybe even afraid of social interactions. I got news for you. There are girls out there who are just as shy as you are. And they're just not afraid of being laughed at or made a fool of or getting hurt. They're afraid of being attacked. So they're just as scared, if not more scared of you than you are of them. Use that. Use the fact that you're, you, you're able to understand their emotional reality in order to find ways to make them feel comfortable when they're around you and at least learn to engage them in conversation. If you're introverted, if you're the type of person that just, it just feels so overwhelming, yeah, it can be overwhelming. That's why you take your time and do the work. Come up with... 10 peak life experiences and best childhood memories of your life. And each one, I want you to write it out. Then you go back and you go through it and you say, am I triggering a mothering instinct in this story? And you remove those mothering instincts. And you talk about those same life experiences in a way that would actually address a girl's emotional needs. And you can do that on your own, in your own time, make it happen. So that when you do finally end up in a conversation with a girl, and it's going to happen, you go out to a party, a house party, a friend's party, you meet somebody's cousin who was the friend of their roommate, you're going to end up meeting people. You might end up meeting girls that, yes, they have boyfriends right now, but you can still make a good charismatic impression by the way you make a person feel. It's a predictable set of behavior patterns. Don't put people down. Engage them on what they're interested in. Make them feel something. And if you're shy and you're introverted, 
you use that to your advantage. The fact is you're probably an incredibly sensitive person. Maybe a little too sensitive, but we can work with that. Because if you're that sensitive, you're going to be able to relate to a woman more than somebody who's not sensitive at all. Is that something more along the lines of what you were looking for? Yes, more uh, in that direction. And um, you, uh, you said to make women feel. I mean, uh, there's certainly a lot of theory about that. But what, what in particular would you advise someone sort of just starting out how to, uh, I guess, become more skilled or more comfortable with the idea of making a woman feel something? Okay, making her feel something. Oh, boy. So much I want to say here, so I'm going to try to condense it. One of the first things I want you to do when you're trying to make a woman feel is that I want you to make her feel that she's earned whatever attention you're giving her. Just giving a woman attention is not the answer. She has to feel she's earned it. So let's say you're having a conversation with a girl and uh, goes into, so what is it that you studied while you were in school? And she says that she's studying, I don't know, finance. Don't turn around and say, wow, that's cool, that's great, you're studying finance. You don't even know if she likes what she's studying. She hasn't earned that prop. Find out more about her. Find out why she's doing it, what she wants to do with it in her life. And if she says, oh, I don't know, I don't know what I'm going to do, so on and so forth, giving her props for studying that is not the right thing to do. Why? She hasn't earned it. It's the girl that maybe goes into it with a story such as, well, my father died when I was a kid and my mother did everything she could to make her make ends meet. And I'm learning finance because I never want to be struggling for money. And I have uh, two younger siblings that once I'm in the workforce, I want to make sure to have a good enough job so I can help them with their education. That's the girl. That's the girl that you want to be looking One with a story where you can say, I can really respect the fact that you're, you know, you're strong in, in family values and you want to take care of your siblings and you want to take care of your mom and you want to, and you're being mindful about other people and not just yourself. Now she knows that she's earned that prop. And that's one of the things you want to make her feel. If all you want to do is make women feel a variety of emotions, use the different senses in everything you say. I have a storytelling program where a major part of the storytelling component is to use sight, sound, taste, smell, and touch so that you can use the various senses. Each person will interpret the world through their senses, but they may not always use the same one. Somebody may be more visual. Someone might be more auditory. Now, can you see how that sounds like an idea that feels right? One sentence, multiple senses. When someone's some major senses are, 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 are tingled, are, 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 well, I'm trying to find the word here. When someone's senses are evoked, when, when someone's senses are engaged, it makes them feel a variety of emotions. Now, if you sit there and you whine and you complain about your life, the other person has to get some of that emotion to be able to relate to you and to get rapport with you. But if most of the things you discuss are favorite memories, things that made you feel good, the person has to experience a little bit of that emotion in order to be able to have rapport with you. Okay, well, let's uh, move on a little bit. To, um, you know, uh, you would describe yourself as being uh, ugly and, uh, um, I, you know, I, I certainly have the impression that, you know, meeting women was never the easiest of things for you. Oh, God. No. Uh, and maybe you can now, based on experience and all of the, uh, you know, uh, coaching that you've done over the years and, uh, you know, what you've seen, what what uh, tips do you have in terms of helping guys to meet women? Everybody tells them, oh, you know, take courses and this type of stuff. But it, it's it's more than just that, especially particularly – I think a lot of the guys that um, that I was referring to, you know, are introverted and shy, and and uh, and you know, how how do you suggest that most of them meet women in the first place? The first step is to decide what kind of a lifestyle you want to have, and then look for women to fulfill those roles. That takes a lot of the pressure and anxiety away. You see, when a guy goes up to a girl, if he doesn't have 
his lifestyle already in mind. His focus is, I want to get her to like me. That puts a lot of pressure and a lot of anxiety and rejection hurts so much. However, if you already have a lifestyle in mind and you're looking for women to fulfill those roles, the primary focus when you start talking to any girl, whether it's online or in person or through a friend, your goal is to get to know them, what we call qualifying, to see what kind of a role she can. That means that it's not about getting her to like you. You don't even know if you want her to like you. It's about figuring out what type of interaction could I potentially have with this girl. Once you figure that out, then you can worry about whether or not she likes you. Chances are, though, that once you communicate that lifestyle and, and what you have in common, she's going to be a lot more open to giving you a chance. So I'll, I'll give you some examples here, okay? So the guys listening to this can do something right now concrete. I want you guys to decide, do you want a series of one-night stands or are you looking for someone serious for marriage uh, and, and maybe, you know, living together? Are you looking to have a series of friends with benefits or are you looking to maybe just get one steady girlfriend that you want to date for a few months and see where it goes? Do you want to maybe have uh, uh, four or five friends with benefits with the possibility that the longer you are with each one, you know, one of them will stand out and maybe move up the hierarchy for you. Do you want to practice open relationships as opposed to practicing monogamous ones? Either one is fine. Either one is fine, but each one has different rules. If you want to practice monogamy, there are certain behaviors that you simply cannot do. And if you want to practice open relationships, there are certain behaviors you cannot do. So which is it? Now, if you're going to say, well, I don't know, now we have to start getting into value elicitation here. This is where we have to. You can have the strictest of monogamy where the two of you aren't really allowed to look or even talk to other people. And then you have monogamy where you can do what you want. I'll do what I want, but we don't have sex or, se or sexually touch another human being. Then you have open relationships as well. You have the no rules open relationships to the open relationships where we're a couple and we're together, but before either of us goes off and brings in a third person or goes with somebody else, we got to check in and we got to make sure it follows certain criteria. That's where I would start. Figure out what kind of a lifestyle you want. And if you're going to say, I want a lifestyle where I can go out and meet women and so forth, then you have to live up to that lifestyle. And part of living up to that lifestyle in particular is to say, well, then you have to push yourself to go out and meet women that can fulfill you. And this is where a lot of guys will struggle. They don't want to change what they have in order to bring in something new. Well, no, it's the opposite. If you want to bring in something new, you're going to have to change what you have right now in order to attract that new thing to you. So figure out what kind of lifestyle you want then worry about where you're going to go. So uh, let's say all you're looking for is friends with benefits because maybe you are in your early 20s, you have a career that you want to build and you want to focus on and you don't even want to you don't even want to think about getting into a serious relationship until you're in your late 20s. So you're 23 now and you wouldn't want a serious girlfriend until you're 29. 23 to 29. So for the next six years, what you really want to do is just be able to go out there, have friends with benefits. Well, do you have a place where women could come over and hang out? No, I'm living at, uh, I'm living with my parents and they don't allow me to bring girls over. Well, you're not exactly living in an environment that's conducive to that lifestyle you want. You might have to make a change. You might have to make a sacrifice. Okay. Uh, you want to be friends with benefits? But are you expecting the girl to only have sex with you or are you okay with she has sex with someone else? Well, no, she should only have sex with me. Well, you just want to be friends with benefits. You don't want to be committing to her, but you're still expecting monogamy, which is a form of commitment. Can't have it both ways. Well, I don't like the idea of any girl having sex with someone else if she's, you know, if she's having sex with me. Then maybe you don't want this lifestyle that you claim to want. Because your values are in conflict with this lifestyle that you're claiming you want. That's what we got to deal with. Meeting girls after that becomes a lot simpler because when you meet a girl and you know, right now, this period of my life, I'm only looking for friends with benefits and I'm, I'm, I'm living 
in alignment with Sari to practice friends with benefits. After that, you find out that she's into it, great. You can move forward with that. Find out she's not into it, it was a pleasure meeting you, but I'm going to go talk to someone else now. You cut down on a lot of the rejection and a lot of the, the, a lot of the useless dating because you're so focused in what it is you want. And you focus on the people who can give you what you want. Let's, let me ask you about, uh, I guess, a pivotal point in your life, which was when you were dating the five women at the same time. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, I'm sure a lot of the guys are curious about the, the whole experience of having multiple women and um, you know, how you juggled them, how you scheduled them, did you bring them together? Uh, you know, how were you able to maintain them? Um, how did you get them to accept it in the first place? Were they all so dating, you know, multiple guys at the same time? You know, how about a little bit of a, a put yourself back into those days and tell us a little bit of how it was. Okay, first thing I want to say is I actually have an ebook and a two-hour uh, audio download on this particular area of my life. Um, it's called The Power of Choice. Where I, where I talk about the exact things that happen in that area of my life. Now, to give you an idea, the first thing is I told every single girl how, and I'll just, I'll tell you as if I was telling the girl, look, my biggest fear in life is getting divorced. I see what divorce does to people. It destroys their lives. People think they're going to be happier after a divorce, and they're not. They tend to be more miserable, especially if they have kids, and now they hardly see the kids. Their expenses go up. Their options go down. And very few people want to date someone that's already been divorced because of all the strings attached and all the further risks. I don't want life. So I need to make sure that if ever I get really serious with somebody, that I have found somebody I could actually make it work long term with that I really believe that there is a, a solid chance that divorce is just not going to be an option for us. For that reason, I don't want to pass up any opportunity. I want to date as many people as possible, partly because I want to make sure that I'm not spending three or four years with the wrong person and then having to start over again. I want to date as many people as possible, get to know as many people as possible, and I need to find out about myself in that process. You know, a quick example I'm not a smoker, and I've always said I don't want to be with a smoker long term. But I've never had the experience of dating someone who's a smoker. So I'll date as many people as possible, and one of them is going to be a smoker, and I'm going to go through that process to say, okay, is it something that I can handle? Is it something that I would actually be okay with? How would I know? I'm going to try. At the same time is that I don't believe that I should block you from meeting someone. If you're with someone else, and that person is like the best possible soulmate for you. I don't want to hold you back. To me, that would be unethical. It would be unethical. My philosophy is everybody has the right to seek out their proper partner. Nobody should, nobody should interfere with that. But until you meet your person that you can be with for the rest of your life, if that's what you want, and until I do, I want to date as many people as possible. So I really like you, and I want to continue to see you. But until we know for sure where this is going, I cannot be monogamous to you. And I refuse to demand that you be monogamous to me. So that's something that I would say to each of the girls. The next thing that I would say is I would never reveal information about the other girls unless I was specifically asked. For example, if they say, well, how many girls are you seeing right now? Well, I don't really tend to talk about that, but and if they're really pushing, I might say, well, I'm only seeing about three people right now, but that can change at any time. Somebody could break up with me. I could dump someone uh, or uh, somebody find someone or I meet someone new. That's The next question is always going to be, well, why would you break up with them? They want to know what would have to happen for them to get dumped. Great. This is a great conversation. If I ever catch you stealing from me, you're gone. If I ever catch you hurting my reputation in my workplace, you're gone. I have those criteria all prepared. This is how I managed it. Um, at the time, I was working full time. So I only had so many hours in the week to devote to seeing different people. Ideally, I would try to meet with them on the weekday nights as much as possible.
possible. Reserving my weekends for uh, socialize, meet new people. Uh, it was easier to keep a particular night. When I would do something with one girl, I would try to do that same thing with all five. So if I had a particular bottle of champagne that I wanted to enjoy with one of the girls uh, on a given evening, I have five dates that followed the same profile with the same champagne. So if it was a whole, if it was a night of champagne with strawberries and chocolate fondue and and whipped cream for her and I in dessert, then I would do that with all five girls. I got to tell you for reasons like that it would get expensive. This is why I entertained at home 90% of the time. Uh, there were some girls who were just as busy as I was and we had our block of time. You know, we had our you know, one girl was a, was the Friday night girl, and Friday night was our block of time because she was busy, I was busy. You don't get much sleep when you're living this lifestyle. Uh, and that was one of the challenges because when you're not getting as much rest as you should, sure, you're happy for the reason you're not getting the rest. But uh, it can impact other areas of your life. Uh, scheduling agendas keeping a journal of what was said because the damage that you could do to someone when you say, do you remember when we did that thing? You never did that with me, Frank. <laughs> you know, there's me being a dork. <laughs> you, you get away with it once in a while. You start getting, you start doing it too much and the girls start feeling special to you. They stop feeling special to you. Then you dating other people is a problem. If each girl feels special to you, they don't mind so much that you're dating somebody else. Some of the women in that group, um, when I told them, you're free to date other people too, can you guess what the first thing they did was? They went out and they had sex with somebody, sometimes more than one person. And then they would say, oh, well, you said I could date somebody else. So last weekend I went and I had sex with my coworker. Ha ha. And they're trying to throw it in my face as if I'm going to get angry, as if I'm going to be hurt. Or, I said, well... I'm not happy that you went and had sex with a coworker because you got to see the person every day and it might make it awkward, but you know, I still like you. It's fine. You know, you, you're free to be with whoever you want to be with. And because I didn't get angry and I didn't get jealous. Oh, they realized that that's not a way that they're going to be able to manipulate me. So now they, they got to focus on other ways to make themselves more endearing to me. So you have to be prepared that when you tell a girl, yeah, you're free to see someone else oh boy <laughs> they are going to go out and they're going to make sure to let you know about it every single time did i bring them together uh not for that first circle of five i did not bring them together and that's because they weren't really open to it i'm a firm believer of when someone issues a boundary you got to respect that boundary now, if one of the girls had said that she was curious about being with another girl, if she was interested in, in possibly exploring that, or even if the girl had said, I'd really like to meet some of these other girls, could we all go out to dinner or something? I would have been, that would have been great. But when I brought up those possibilities and I received a, a negative reaction to it, I was fine with it. I don't push on boundaries. I'll tap on them. I'll, I'll bring it up. I'll make the offer. But if somebody is not okay with something, there's no value in pushing it because there's too many other people out there who are going to give you what you want to try and convince somebody who's not interested. Uh, having to manage them, another aspect. For each girl who would leave personal belongings, I would always put it in a very particular drawer, a hidden drawer. So that drawer in that corner is for girl number one. That drawer in that corner is for girl number two. And I never let the girls know where any other girl's drawer was. So it took a lot of management. And uh, it, was part, it was a main reason was that they didn't really want to know about each other. Only one girl really wanted to know the details of it. But part of the reason she wanted to do that is that she got a vicarious thrill hearing about what it is I did with the other girls. I wanted to meet them or do anything with them. There was just something about knowing that her guy was doing other things with other girls that, on the one hand, she says was frustrating to her, but, but at the same time, she was 
getting a rush from it. Um, the thing to realize also is that that any time people can leave. And sometimes girls would get frustrated because, well, where is this going? And I would sit down with them and say, okay, you want to know where this is going? Let's go. Where is this going? I don't know. And I had had a life client saying, are you ready to drop everything to be with me? Are you ready to come with me if I decide to move to this city and so on? And anytime a girl says, well, I don't know, I says, well, that's where this is going. You don't know. You're making demands on me, but when I ask you questions like, are you ready to drop everything and follow me wherever I go? And now you're thinking about your job and your family and your this and your that. Well, you're not willing to make me a priority. You have no business demanding any sort of commitment. You know, uh, your uh, drawer story reminded me of, uh, uh, you, you must remember the stories of Rick H., yeah. From, from many years ago. And I, I yeah. he had a similar situation. He had his, he had like one sort of, I don't know if it was a basket or whatever. He used to call it lost and found. <laughs> he would just sort of dump it all in there and tell them if they lost, if they forgot something, just go look in the lost and found. Yeah. So I always found that pretty amusing. And it just sends the message of, look, if you're going to leave a territory marker, uh, I have no problem with you knowing about the others and having them knowing about you. Yes, so it, so. it basically didn't it didn't work is the message back to them that it didn't do any didn't do any of the yeah. intended uh, of its intended in, uh, reasons for being done. Yeah, and you know now let me let me sort of backtrack a little bit. Uh, you know, going from five women at the same time to uh, you know back to your five year drought. Um, I think that one of the things a lot of the Guys that uh, I call them the uh, the newbies, the beginners on on my list would be interested to hear about is how you went from that five year drought to you made your first transition transition to having sex for the first time after all of that after that kind of a of a I guess very negative experience and 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 you know a very uh, you know heavy sort of uh, thing to have gone through. Um. I had made so many changes in the way I behaved, so many changes in the way I lived. Uh, I'll make uh, one thing that led up to it. I had a little space in my parents' basement because I was in a situation where, you know, I had to live in my parents' basement for a while. And I had an office space in that basement, and I reorganized that office space where I got rid of one third of all my books and possessions and folders and things that I really wasn't going to use. And I created enough space to put a single bed in there. Uh, and I was like, okay, I designed it with the pillows to make it look like a couch, but basically I created a space where I could have sex. If you want to have sex in your life, you're going to have to create a space where you can have sex both spiritually and physically. So when I finally brought a girl downstairs into that office space with the bed, there was a place for me to physically be intimate. So it was many changes like that that led up to it. And what did it feel like when it finally happened? Um, I describe it as losing my virginity for a second time. It was this sense of disbelief. Like, it wasn't actually me doing it. I was as if I was, you know, I was, if I was watching someone else go through these motions and do it and wait a minute, it's me and I'm saying all the right things and I'm doing all the right things and, and she's enjoying it. Wow. She's someone's enjoying being with me. And that was a nice feeling. And it brought me an incredible, <clears throat> It brought me an incredible amount of peace. It was just, uh, and, and for the record, like I'm not this wonderful, amazing, great lover, okay? I, I can be attentive, and I put her enjoying it as a priority, but it was just so nice to, to feel close to somebody and, and, and somebody wanting me in that way that once it was done, there was just that incredible bit of peace that after five years of being touch starved was, um, it, it completely changed my energy. And I had to adopt a sense of detachment from 
you know, because remember, when I was going through this period of experimentation, I went in with the thought that I'm doing this to learn. I'm doing this to learn. I'm doing this to learn. Three years of trial and error. I'm doing this to learn. I'm doing this to learn. That I get this far, great, but I'm not here to enjoy it. It's doing this to learn, doing this to learn. Had sex. And I was still in the mode of, I'm doing this to learn. I'm doing this to learn. Oh, my God, I'm having sex. No, no, stop. You're doing this to learn. You're doing this to learn. And afterwards, it was a matter of, wow, that, that just happened. I feel normal. That was it. The sense of peace. I felt normal. I felt like this is what normal people do. They find other people they like and they have sex and they both enjoy it. It. I felt normal. Well, I guess, uh, uh, you know, what sort of uh, do you think... I, I, I know that you sort of prepared your space to, uh, that you, you mentioned you prepared your space for having sex. Uh, so you were kind of lining it up, you were preparing it in a lot of ways mentally, I, I, I gather. Yep. But um, I think a lot of guys would be interested in a little bit more of the, you know, how did you take that particular woman that you met for that time into the, from, you know, from whatever experiences you were having previous to that for those five years, to shifting that particular one into a physical relationship. Okay. For that particular one, it was uh, all through conversation on the phone initially. Well, uh, and, she had, and she in, in, addition, in addition, like what would you might do now to, to even improve uh, that situation if you were in it again? You know, there's not much I would do to improve on it because I found a system that works and I would just repeat it. Uh, I, know, I know that sounds arrogant, but there really wasn't anything to improve on. That particular girl is a girl that I had known uh, for 10 years. And there had been a little bit of chemistry there when I knew her 10 years prior, but I had no ability to be able to transition it into something else. Uh, then 10 years later, I'm just on the phone with her chit-chatting and... What I'm doing is that I'm, in, in my speak, I'm addressing emotional needs and I'm saying certain things that's allowing her to see me as a different person. I talked about my catharsis. I talked about things. I didn't get into all the bad things. I just said that my life has taken some turns and I've, and I've had to learn and, and make the most of it. And by addressing emotional needs, anytime that she said something that would even be slightly mothering of me, I said, it's okay. You don't have, a, have to mother me. I already have a mother and I, and I don't even listen to her. I would I would just make her feel something. And at the end of it, I just pitched, yeah, you know what? We should hang out. We should get together sometime. And because we had been friends for 10 years, she was like, oh, I don't know if I could do that. I, I really, I'm, I'm not sure. And that's like, okay, well, you know what? The, infer, the, the thing is out there. And she says, well, why don't we get together just as friends? And I said, no. I'm not interested in getting together as just friends. I like you, and if you want to get together, great. Let's just get together and see what happens. But I'm not going to get together and just say we're going to be friends and nothing else. I'd rather just be going there with an open mind. And that's really what I stress because when she was trying to put up those blocks, I just said, no, if that's what you're going to be, well, let's not meet. And we hung up the phone, and it was a few weeks later that she sent me an email saying, uh, I've been thinking about what you said and, and she's going on and on. And I'm just like, uh, I, cause I, again, this was for me. I wasn't even expecting her to write to me, but she wrote to me, let's just get together. I just never thought of you in that way. But, but you know, all so much of what you said and a long lengthy email exchange. Look, why don't we just get together? Come on over here. I got a nice place in the basement here. Got a nice big comfy couch. We can listen to music. We can talk about it. She shows up, comes on down, and within about, I would say, a half hour, we were having sex. Now, she had already decided that she was going to have sex with me as long as I didn't creep her out. So when we came into the basement and she saw that everything was was designed in a way to make Willie comfortable, 
And she had already had the interest and she knew I had told her ahead of time. No, I'm not interested in hanging out as just friends. She knew I was going to make a pass at her. I just told her as much and I, in that conversation on the phone. I made mention if we get together and things are going well, I'm probably going to make a pass at you. I'm a man. Okay. And if you don't, if you're not interested, that's okay. But no, we're not going to hang out just as friends. So she knew I was going to make a pass at her. And when I did, one thing led to the other, and she was looking for she was looking for that experience. One of the things I, I really want to communicate to the guys here is that this whole notion of women think sex is wrong and women think sex is icky, and women enjoy sex too. Women want to have sex. This whole notion that women are asexual is is, is not correct. Women want to experience the pleasures and the and the ex exploration of sex just like guys do they just want to feel process and they don't want mother in order to accommodate you okay uh one other thing i wanted to cover basically is um uh you know you've been doing a lot of coaching over the last several years what are the uh kind of the main issues that guys come to you with uh that uh and and what have you been particularly successful with on in coaching coaching them about okay um the, the audio is breaking up here uh, do you want to do you want can you still hear me clearly yes okay uh number one i help adult male virgins get their first girlfriend using my emotional needs system i also have a program for adult male virgins as to what to do that first time from the time you bring them in to the time you start touching them, giving a massage, you're dancing in the private space you're in, getting your space ready for sex. Um, so I work with a lot of adult male virgins. That's my specialty. I also coach women. I coach women on uh, how to find that right guy, how to get themselves to that point where, uh, you know, if they're their clock is ticking and they're looking for a great guy or if they're past their biological clock and now they're looking for a life companion to be mindful of what men want and how men choose to commit to women that just because he has sex with you or just because he's giving you attention doesn't mean he wants to commit to you. I work with couples who are struggling, uh, couples who love each other, but they just cannot communicate. They just can't reach that point of consensus of, and I teach, I teach her about the emotional needs of men, emotional needs of women, and they interconnect that way. Sometimes I'm dealing with, with a guy who is trying to get over an ex, like I was struggling to get over my ex, teaching a point himself, out what he wants to do with his life with her if he still wants to see her. Uh, move a little bit into life coaching where... Uh, people are coming to me and they're trying to figure out their path plan, trying to figure out you know, how they want to make money going forward. And, and not that I'm a financial guru or anything of that nature, far from. Figuring out, you know what your passion is, you can practice that passion in order to go forward and, and build a future that way. Um, probably the best success story I have is an adult male virgin who was about to turn 30 and he studied the emotional needs material over a 14 day period. So I, I think he went on a vacation. It's like, I'm going on vacation for 14 days. I said, study the emotional needs every day while you're on vacation. He didn't go anywhere. He didn't travel. He just stayed home, studied the emotional needs. And on the fourth day of his vacation, he met a girl that morning. That night he had sex with her, was ex, and she became his girlfriend for a few weeks. Uh, I've had other guys that have lost their virginity in as soon as three months because it's not just a matter of here, say this and it'll work. We, we change on the specific behaviors and we practice those so that once he gets into that situation, she doesn't need to know that he has no experience before they have sex. Most of the guys that I've coached, the girls afterwards say like, yeah, you've done this before. And meanwhile, he's like, oh, I haven't, uh, but we don't talk about that, <clears throat> you know, but it's a great experience for them. Um, 
I think more than anything, it's helping guys realize that that insurmountable thing, dating three women at the same time, I could never do that. Actually, you can. Uh, because of my background, and I mentioned this earlier in this talk, I share a lot of my background about my past growing up in that environment where sex was dirty and evil and, you know, akin to the devil. I've actually helped off cults, meaning that they made the decision to not have any contact with their parents anymore because they have left a cult environment saying, I, I got to go off and have a life of my own to them so that they become socially, you know, for lack of a better term, socially normal being able to relate to other people and being able to have sexual relations that normal without this, this horrible uh, um, following of, of these cult like belief systems. So uh, I, I've been very fortunate in the sense that I've been able to help quite a few people. Well, I think, uh, I think you've given a very good, a picture of uh, you know what you've been through and what you've been doing for guys and uh, and women as well. Um, I'd like to give you the, to I'd like you to sort of tell us a little bit about what products you have to offer for people, what uh, events or products or uh, you know whatever it is that you do your coaching, and uh, you know let, give them an opportunity to uh, to find out more about what they can learn from you. Okay, let's just make this quick because I'm really not a salesy guy. I'm not a marketing guy. Uh, best thing to do is just visit the website, franktalks.com. Loving relationships starts with Frank Talks, franktalks.com. Um, coaching is by the minute. You're billed by the minute. An hour of coaching and we only use 45 minutes of it you can still call back uh, and talk if coaching is pay as you go. And that includes, uh, Frank, I'm in a situation. Can I talk to you for seven minutes? I've been minutes. Now you're feeling back minutes from your prepay. Um, so that's for the coaching, the books, emotional needs, uh, all my books on emotional needs are there on emotional needs. And then there's specialty products for adult male virgins. The first 10 times you have sex, uh, managing multiple girlfriends, older men, younger women is a program as well. From friends to lovers, something I've practiced a number of times. Uh, a book uh, helping guys who want to steal a girl from a jerk. And a warning in those books about what they're going to have to deal with because a girl who's used to dating jerks and then she dates you a nice guy, she's going to put you through a lot. You know, and, and then you think it's worth it. Um, an entire program on first dates and you know, who should pay for a date and how do you bring that up? And should you go in for a kiss? And if so, why? Um, because a lot of the advice that I studied when I first started this almost 15, 20 years ago, a lot of that advice doesn't apply now because there's a lot of different expectations in society. Guys don't want to get married, and rightly so, when you have a legal system really conducating men to get married. And what to do in those situations where you're in that situation where you're dating somebody and they're pushing for marriage and although you would like to have them as a live-in partner, you don't necessarily want to go through the process of marriage, that situation. Um, so a lot of programs dealing with that, a program on monogamy for people who want to be monogamous and, uh, and what behaviors support a monogamous lifestyle. I have a program on alternative relationship choices covering everything from open relationships and the different uh, relationship categories, whether it's swinging or polyamorous. I've included BDSM into that, uh, sharing some of my experiences within that culture and what makes it work there. Um, I think that pretty much covers everything. There's still more. I mean, obviously I've written, uh, you know, storytelling, uh, the art of calibration where I give you a step-by-step -step guide to how to become more charismatic. So if you're struggling with give you the formula 
of how to be more charismatic. And it's not, it's not all wishy-washy theory. There's concrete steps and concrete beliefs that you have to employ, concrete behavior patterns. Dating within social circles. Don't make a mistake or you lose the entire social circle. There's a way to conduct yourself when you want to start dating somebody in a social circle. Um, so I think that pretty well covers a lot of, of what the, what you'll find there. So you got the audio programs, you got the eBooks and you got the coaching. Well, that's, uh, that's very good to know. And I, I wanted to let, uh, the people listening to this, that if you basically order something from Frank and send him and me an email saying that you got to Frank and his, uh, products and events and coaching through Cliff's list, uh, I will send you in addition, a, a special free bonus product uh, just as a thank you for having uh, gotten to Frank through us. Um, I guess, Frank, I want to thank you very much for taking the time with me today. I think you've uh, given a lot of good insights to the guys, and um, I'm, uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing the responses to these. I'm looking forward to it as well, and uh, this is actually one of the first times you and I have appeared on a program together, uh, despite knowing each other from the very beginning of all this. Uh, FYI, Cliff wrote the intro, my best-selling book, Everything Out of Her Mouth is a Test, because he knew me way back when. He saw me when I really was just starting out on this, and he, he's uh, been a witness to everything that's happened since then. So it was great that we finally got a chance to work on a, a project like this. Well, I, I enjoyed it very much, and I, I think it went very well, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll be getting some good response to it. Look so, forward to it. Take care, all right. everybody. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.